when my friend saw the movie, he said, he said, it just doesn't work. And I said, I know it doesn't look. Zandali might be the perfect embodiment of Nicolas Cage's filmography. At times, hard to watch, but harder to look away because certain moments brand their celluloid images onto your brain. There are scenes in Zandali that will widen your eyes with clockwork orange-like intensity as Nicolas Cage slow dances with Judge Reinhold and has a breakdown where he covers himself entirely in black paint. <laughs> Somehow, the behind-the-scenes stories are even nuttier. This is the story of Zandali, director Sam Pillsbury. It's funny, I, I, I had a very good friend who read the script a long time ago, and then when the movie came out, it got such bad reactions from people, probably more because of the, the straightforwardness of the sex. And the, the, I don't know if I told you that when they, when they, screened, when they tested it, pe- half the people walked out of the theater. But, you know, it's, one of the things I did, I feel very strongly that the way most American films portray sex is just ludicrous, you know. Um, you, don't, you don't go to bed. You, you, don't make, you don't make love with a woman while she has her bra and panties on, you know. Give me a fucking break. I mean, it's just pathetic. It's, it's all about us being hung up about sex. So one of the things that I made clear at the beginning I, with, with both of them um, was – that we were going to play these sex scenes nude, and that we would just be careful, you know, what we showed. But, but, but I, you can't, you can't shoot around bra straps and panties, you know, like you can't. It's just bullshit. So you wind up just showing people's heads, and it's just so phony. And the way the the way the French do these kinds of movies is they just people get into bed and they make love, and you know, you see a bit of this and a bit of that, and who cares? Anyway, there's a huge difference. And you shouldn't cast aspersions on people you don't know. Huh. We're inevitable. I want to shake you naked and eat you alive, Zondelay. When my friend saw the movie, he said, he said, it just doesn't work. And I said, I know it doesn't work. And he, and, and I said, I, he said, there's no way you could have made that script work. And I think what I, it, it, I remember I sort of got caught up in making it because I'd been in I'd been in L.A. for well over a year. I hadn't got any work. I got offered this picture. It was funded. It had Nicolas Cage attached. And I just thought maybe I can figure out how to make it work. But the trouble is I never did before. So I just I shot the movie. Okay. What happens is when you read a script, the the best thing that can happen is when you finish it, you go, I know exactly how to make this movie. And the other one is that you work on it for quite a long time and you go, okay, I think I can make this work by doing these things. You know, by by taking this approach. And then the third one is what I did with Emily Lee, which is I'll just shoot it. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, I was very definite about a lot of things. It's an amazing cast, but there's some there's some dishonest things about it. The, 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 the writer, Mary Cornell, she, I think she had a very romanticized view of New Orleans. And when I went and spent some time there, I just had a different view of it. I just didn't think it was romantic and sexy and, and magical. I thought there was incredible poverty there. There was black ghetto literally across the street from the French Quarter. You had to be careful walking around at night because there was there was people who would target you. Uh, people go down there and get as drunk as shit. You know, there are there were a lot of amazing things about it. And I loved I love the food and I love I love the music, although I got awful tired of the fucking tuba blowing the whole fucking time and not very well. But I, I didn't I I didn't find my own personal view of New Orleans evolved while I was shooting the movie and it was sort of different from what was at the base of the script. But the final thing I want to say is I finally, about 20 years after I made the movie, I woke up and I went, oh, fuck, I know what I should have done. What happened was when I went to pick Nicholas Cage up at the airport, we hadn't talked. We'd met, that's all. We met once and he agreed to do the movie. When I picked him up at the airport, he turned up looking like he does in the movie. And, and I was kind of shocked 
And then I thought, oh, you know, he's an amazing guy. I'll just trust that he can make this work. What should have happened was, and it would have made Zanderley less of a victim, is if he had started the movie as a as an extremely civilized, gentle, well organized, compassionate character, and then his arc was that he gradually became more and more insane until he destroyed her. That's a story worth telling. The trouble is, he started like a lunatic. So anyone who let, in my view, anyone who lets someone like that ruin your life is kind of not, you know, not very together. I think money is an excuse for a lack of art, anyway. I don't care who you are, Donald Trump, who the hell. Without creativity, without life, then you are truly unable to go straight up the devil's ass. Look him right in the face, smile, and survive. I hadn't worked out how to make the movie, and I hadn't considered, if I had already figured out to have to have his arc of character be like that, you know, for, for him to, if, if I had already worked out how to do it in the way that I described to you that I think would work, I would have said to Nicholas, look, that's great. That's where you end up. That's not where you start. I just, I hadn't worked it out. I had, I had wrestled with that movie for several months trying to figure out how I could make it my film and how I could make it work. There's another thing too, is I've done about, about three films that I've made. I've made, there were other, there were other people's movies like they wrote the script and i tried to make their movie you can't do that you can't do it, it doesn't work you've got to make your own movie and you've just got to take it away from everybody else and make it your own but so so when nicholas turned up i thought well you look he looked amazing he looked like he looked crazy and dynamic and amazing and he was he was perfectly professional and he was great to work with and if i didn't like something he would change it it was my fault i mean i don't think he took a very intelligent approach to the character because He's kind of someone who likes to make instant sensations all the time. But he would have he would have listened to me if I said, No, this is what this is what we're gonna do and it would have fucking worked too. So there it is. <laughs> There's that movie. It's it's well it's well shot, it's it's got a lot of brave things about it. I don't think there's ever been an ever been an American movie with sex scenes like that in it. And um, I think it was the first NC-17 American film, actually. I'm not sure about that. It was either the first or the second. So, you know, anyway, that's too late to fix it. <laughs> oh. Jock and yours better in here, huh? Yeah? Huh? Well, fuck! Shit! Strike me down, Lord, because if you can't fucking leave him, I'll make you fucking leave him! Shut up! Shut up! I mean, the, the, the lead actress... Erica, she wasn't. She was. She was not a hell of a good actress. But I couldn't find somebody who was kind of that you would want to look at naked, who was a really great actress. I found one. I found some, you know, who were great actresses who didn't look very good naked, and then there was a bunch that looked good naked. Whatever. So she was kind of the best thing I could come up with. But but she was so self conscious. She'd never been in a movie before. That her acting was was just um, was really not good. And I saw the movie completely going down the toilet. So I would. One of the ways you can make people stop being self-conscious is to yell at them, which is a horrible thing to do, and I hate doing it, and it breaks my heart, or slap them in the face. So what happens is their adrenaline starts to run, and they, and they, they forget, they completely drop being self-conscious, and they, and they act real. So I would, I would grab her and go around, go around off the set and grab her and then shake her and, and sort of – she knew what I was doing. I mean it was, it was done with her agreement. But it was it was tough to do, but it did work. I mean, she actually did pretty good. You, you should have seen you should have seen her rehearsal before I did that. It was like you couldn't even the movie would just wouldn't go anywhere. You know, she was very self conscious. She's a she's a model, and that's the opposite of being an actor. You know, I mean, with most of us, they work from the outside in instead of from the inside out. But boy, she looked good with her clothes on. <laughs> There's some there's some things that I remember extremely well. I mean, extremely well. I mean, I mean there's another thing. Judge Reinhold was. I mean, he he would he he would throw these screaming fits and stuff. And I think actually a really funny thing happened one day. He he's he's he would throw fits about things, but he would never throw a fit if Nicholas was around. Um, it was very it was very interesting to watch how he behaved. And there was one I got so sick of it that. He would walk into a he would walk into a set and throw up sit about where the chest of drawers was because he'd imagined it was somewhere else and he'd worked out how he was going to do the scene. You know, like it was just ridiculous. So one night 
going to do this scene, and I think it was his apartment. I can't remember. I said the crew was all like totally fed up, and I said to the crew, I said, "Listen, I want you guys to understand something. If he comes in here and throws a fit about this set, I'm going to fucking scream at him for five minutes." And and so they all kind of nodded, you know. <laughs> he came in and threw a fit, and I fucking let loose at him at the top of my lungs. But what happened was I had so much pent up anger about him that I actually literally lost this. <laughs> like like it was like this volcano of lava vomit coming out of my mouth and I couldn't stop it. I just went on and on and on. Finally when I finished the <laughs> the whole crew was in the room they all they all clapped and <laughs> broke into applause. And Judd ran down the stairs and went running down the street screaming and smashing windows. You know, we could all hear it. And what what was so funny was the crew thought that the whole thing I did was a total act. And what it really was was it started out as an act and then I literally lost it. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> in another scene, Cage and Reinhold have a confrontation in an office. Reinhold tries to steal the scene, but Nick Cage had a few tricks up his sleeve. I seem to remember... Um, Nicholas adding something to it, like the way he looked at Judge at some point. I can't remember what it was, but Nicholas took that and really made it work. I mean, for sure. And yeah, they they Judge hated. Oh, what what I can't remember. Judge, I know what it was. The eating the peach wasn't in the script, and Judge always wanted Judge always wanted to win the 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 on screen showdown with Nicholas, right? And Nicholas decided to not let that happen, so he he grabbed that peach and took that bite out of it at the end. That wasn't in the script. That was that was Nicholas taking over. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you get promoted when you're already the boss? Well, I'm not the boss. It's not my father's company anymore. Well, congratulations. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah, you're turning out to be a real executive dude. Look, I'm on lunch break. Yes, I know. I took care of it. Take a seat. Thanks. You want to share my peach? No, thanks. Nicholas would do these really funny things. Like we'd be we'd be standing on the sidewalk at night, and people would talk to him and, and say, "Oh, um, oh, they'd confuse him for another actor, like um, Tom." They say, "Oh, Tom, oh, Tom, <laughs> oh, Tom Cruise, I love him. <laughs> He's so great." <laughs> Nicholas would just, you know, go, oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> and he would do really funny things like we would eat out at a restaurant and people would, would notice who we all were and whether we were together or something like that. And, and then we went, we, 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 I remember the couple of times we, we wound up, Nicholas and I wound up standing on one of the tables singing to the to the restaurant full of people. I mean, Nicholas would do these amazing things. And the other thing that he would do sometimes was one night we were standing on the side of the road and he nudged me, and I, I turned to look at him. It was, it was dark. And he bent over, and he'd, he'd wrapped his penis around his wrist. <laughs> and he, said, he nudged me and said, want to see my new watch? <laughs> and he, was, he would do funny shit like that. He was quite a lot of fun, really, to work with. So. Did you ever do any of the other things? Did you ever do any of the other things? That he did was um, he insisted on looking at all the dailies because he's because if his penis ever appeared in a shot that was that was like we made this agreement okay I'll, I'll, we'll never show your penis and I know it sounds a bit like a double standard because we do show her naked but you know her genitals are inside you know like I do get it but one day he just made this odd move and there's like three frames where you can see his dick and <laughs> so he he actually went to the lab and supervised the, the lab technicians cutting those frames out of the negative, you know, which was fine. But what the funny part of this story is what he did from then on, the next time we saw the scene, he wrapped, you know what gaffer tape is? It's, it's duct tape, basically. He wrapped all this gaffer tape around his dick and his balls so that there's no way that th- that scene would could be seen. And it, but but we lost like an hour. He spent so much time fucking around. And, I, and in every blow budget movie that you do, you lose an hour. It's gone forever. You don't get you know the studio doesn't put more money in because there isn't any more money. It's just that. So I was kind of pissed. So I just said to a couple of the, the cinematographer and a couple of other guys, I said, 
kid up. Let's take him out after after we have to watch him get this fucking duct tape off of his bulls. <laughs> he's gonna be in so much pain. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that was pretty pretty. <sighs> But if I can't paint, everything just turns to shit. 